Clean air. Good morning. Real quick before we get started, we want to check to make sure that everybody can hear us. Uh, if you could just respond real quick in the chat box, uh, confirming that you can hear us. Great. Thank you. Uh, so good morning again. I want to thank you for joining us this morning for our annual FHWA Emergency Relief Program Overview. My name is Lisa Busher, and I'm the district's local program administrator. I'm joined today by Chris Barone, our deputy district maintenance en engineer, along with Lena Maldonado, who is the FHWA transportation engineer covering District 5, and her colleague and definitely an ER guru, Mahmoud Youssef. Kathy Alexander from program management is also here, and she will be moderating questions for us and already technical difficulties. During today's training, I'm going to provide a general program overview, as well as walk through the application process for FHWA ER funds. I'm then going to hand things over to Chris, who's going to discuss the emergency versus permanent repairs, debris removal, and the Detailed Damage Inspection Report, or DDIR, process. I will close out our time together discussing contracting methods for ER funds, as well as the District 5 coordination process. Throughout the training, uh, please feel free to submit questions using the chat feature. We will be pausing uh, at certain times to answer those questions, and then at the very end of the presentation, we'll also hit on any uh, remaining questions. The presentation, as well as some other handouts, are available in the handout section, so please feel free to download those. And fingers crossed, we're recording today's webinar and intend to make it, along with the presentation, available in the near future. So let's jump right in. Uh, there are two separate federal disaster programs. The FHWA Emergency Relief Program is activated when a governor's proclamation of a state of emergency or a presidential declaration of a state of emergency is issued. FEMA's program, which is the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, activates upon a presidential declaration. The FHWA ER program provides disaster assistance for federal aid highways, while FEMA's program provides disaster assistance for non-federal aid highways. Additionally, upon activation, FEMA becomes the primary source of reimbursement for debris removal activities. And Chris is going to discuss that in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. FDOT is the pass-through agency for the FHWA ER program, so the ER program is going to be our focus for the remainder of this presentation. With the exception of confirming when debris removal is eligible under FHWA versus when it's eligible under FEMA, the department is not involved with, nor do we really know any of the details on how the FEMA program operates. If you have any questions regarding FEMA funding, you'll need to reach out directly to your agency's FEMA representative. So what is the ER program? Per 23 U.S. Code 125A, the ER program provides for the repair or reconstruction of highways, roads, and trails that have suffered serious damage as a result of a natural disaster over a wide area or catastrophic failures from any external cause. Natural disasters are defined as an unusual natural occurrence which causes serious damage over a wide area. In Florida, we immediately think of hurricanes. However, ER is not just limited to hurricanes. Other types of natural disasters that could result in ER funding include tornadoes, like the one that just occurred in the Nashville area, or wildfires, like we hear about in California and Arizona, and occasionally experienced here in Florida as well. A catastrophic failure is the sudden failure of a major element or segment of a federal road, 
which is not primarily attributable to gradual and progressive deterioration or a lack of proper maintenance. These pictures show examples of catastrophic failure. The picture on the left is a bridge that collapsed due to impact from a barge. The picture on the right is something we experience a little bit more frequently in our area, a sinkhole. Each year, there is a $100 million set aside from the Highway Trust Fund for nationwide coverage. In order, to be, in order for emergency relief funding to be requested, there must be a minimum in $700,000 in damages caused by the event. As previously mentioned, the FHWA ER program provides disaster assistance for federal aid highways. Local roads and rural minor collectors would fall under FEMA. Federal aid eligible roadways are those shown on the approved federal aid map and the list maintained by the FDOT State Planning Office. The hyperlink on this slide will take you to the Florida Federal Aid System page on our website. This is a screenshot of the landing page uh, for that website. I know it's hard to see on the slide, but on this page, you can access the federal aid report in PDF or Excel format, as well as federal aid highway maps in various formats. I personally find the federal aid report in Excel file format to be the most user-friendly, as you can filter the data by district, county, et cetera. This is a screenshot of a small section of the Federal Aid Road Report in Excel file format. For purposes of this presentation, I've hidden a few columns, but those with the most meaningful information from emergency relief perspective are shown. In this screenshot, we see 10 different sections of the same roadway ID, which is in column E, and the county road, which is in column H. You will notice that, like many roads in our area, there are three different local names to this roadway in column I. What is more important to notice is that the emergency funding changes depending on the section of roadway. Column D shows that the first three segments of roadway from milepost 0.287 to milepost 0.789 as seen in columns J and L are FHWAER, while the remaining seven segments of roadway from milepost 0.789 to milepost 22.683 are under FEMA. So, following an emergency event, approximately half a mile of this roadway would be eligible for funding from the FHWAER program, while the majority of the roadway, almost 22 miles, would fall under FEMA jurisdiction. Looking at column Q, federal system, you will also notice that those sections of roadway under FEMA say FA-none or federal aid none. This is additional confirmation that these sections of roadway are not eligible for FHWA ER funding. As a side note, you can use this exact same chart and logic when trying to determine if you are considering applying for federal funding for a roadway project. If column D says FHWER and column Q says FTP, or in some cases NHS, then the roadway could be eligible for federal funding through the LAP program. If column D says FEMA and column Q says FA none, then the roadway is not eligible for federal funding through the LAP program. There are some exceptions, however, such as safety projects, sidewalk projects, and trails, though those same projects would not be eligible for FHWA ER funds. For an individual site to be considered for emergency relief funding, the site must have suffered $5,000 in damages. Meeting the $5,000 threshold does not guarantee site eligibility. Sites cannot be combined to meet the $5,000 threshold unless they are in the same federal aid roadway and are within one quarter mile from each other. For example, if there's a damaged sign at mile zero on federal aid highway A, another damaged sign within eighth of a mile on the same federal aid highway, and a third damaged sign another eighth of a mile down the same federal aid highway, 
then all three signs could be combined to meet the $5,000 threshold. As soon as there is more than one quarter mile between damage and or the damage transitions to a different federal aid highway, the sites can no longer be combined. The only items included when determining if the $5,000 threshold has been met are materials, equipment, and labor. Once the $5,000 threshold has been met, other items such as mobilization, maintenance of traffic or MOT, preliminary engineering, and CEI can be incorporated into the DDIR to determine the total damage for the site. And Chris will touch more on the development of the DDIR shortly. This time we'll take a quick pause to see if any questions have come in. We don't have any questions so far, but if you'd like to enter a question, we'll wait a minute or two and then ask. No questions. So we'll proceed on, but again, if any questions come up, uh, feel free to type them in and we can address them at a later time. Uh, hi, sorry, this is Yusuf. Yes, Yusuf. Yeah, can you go back to the previous slide pretty quick? Really? Just, just to make a quick, quick clarification, when we say that materials, equipment, are, and labor, they go into the $5,000 threshold, uh, we're not saying that when you write that EDIR, you break it down by equipment, labor, and material. Uh, take under consideration that that pay items, they already include those uh, those payments. Like they, they're inflated to include equipment and labor in them. So we, we don't expect the local agencies to put like tractor, uh, laborer, and th that type of information on the EDIR. Thank you for that clarification. No problem. So for an event to be eligible for emergency relief funding, there must be a governor's proclamation or a president's declaration confirming the event and the impacted areas. FDOT will submit a letter of intent to FHWA confirming the department's intent to request relief funding. FHWA will acknowledge the department's request and an FHWA el eligibility finding will be provided by the Florida Division Administrator. FDOT will complete and submit a damage survey summary report to the FHWA Florida Division Office. This summary is used by the Division Administrator to make a preliminary eligibility determination as outlined in step four of the prior slide. The summary report contains a description of damage, an approximate cost of damage for each county, a description of the limits and damages with dates of occurrence, and photos of each county with maps. In order to provide the most accurate information to FHWA and to maximize eligibility potential, it is important that you, as a local agency, provide damage information to the district as quickly as possible following an emergency event. This information will be incorporated into the summary. Following an emergency event, FHWA is responsible for requesting emergency relief funding from FHWA, participating on detailed damage teams, which are identifying damage sites, completing the Detailed Damage Inspection Report, or DDIR, which Chris will cover in more detail shortly, completing emergency repairs on state highway facilities, administering permanent repair projects, and coordinating locally administered projects. Following an emergency event, each local agency is responsible for coordinating with FDOT, participating on detailed damage teams, identifying damage sites, completing emergency repairs, and administering permanent repair projects. And it's important to note that in order to administer a permanent repair project, a local agency must be LAP certified. 
We'll take another moment and uh, pause for questions. We still have none, but uh, we'll give another second. And uh, Lena or Mahmoud, is there anything uh, that you want to add while we're waiting for questions? I'm good. I'm good, Lisa, at this point. No questions. Okay, so I'm now going to turn things over to Chris, who will provide information related to emergency and permanent repairs. Chris? Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, everyone, for participating in our virtual emergency relief FHWA training. First, we're going to talk about the um, difference between emergency and permanent repairs. And so for the purpose and intent of emergency repairs, the emergency repair is, is to repair damage resulting directly from an eligible event, such as a hurricane. We're most familiar with hurricanes in our corridor. And then work performed prior to landfall is not eligible. And it's not, the ER program is not intended to take the place of any existing state or local programs already in place. And keep in mind, it's to restore the facility or the corridor to pre-disaster conditions. The program is not intended to cover all repairs, to relieve heavy maintenance responsibilities of Fed Aid recipients, and it's not intended for damage on non-Fed aid highways. Emergency repairs may begin without FHWA prior authorization, and emergency repairs will be um, reimbursed at 100% if the work is complete within 180 days. And after 180 days, the normal pro rata share for work will start to kick in, and that will be 90% for interstates and 80% for other corridors. The intent or the plan for emergency repairs is to minimize the extent of damage, to protect your remaining facilities from any other damage that may occur, and most importantly, to restore essential traffic. And restore essential traffic means, at the minimum, repairs necessary to open the roadway to emergency vehicles, utility, construction vehicles, and roadways that lead to emergency facilities if there are no detours available. And keep in mind that safety is not a justification for determining ER eligibility, and life lighting is considered a safety feature. So this flow chart will help you when you're starting to evaluate your emergency repairs. So your first question is, is the road closed? And if the road is closed, if your answer to that is no, then your emergency repairs will consist of minimum repairs to restore essential traffic. If the answer to the question, if the road is closed, yes, then the next thing you wanna consider is a detour available. And if the answer to that is no, then here again, we're gonna look at minimum repairs to restore essential traffic. If the answer is yes, a detour is available, then the MOT and detour are eligible for emergency repairs. And temporary repairs to the damaged roadway to protect it from future damages could be eligible for emergency repairs as well. And so, are there any questions? Any clarification from FHWA at this time? No questions here. No. So now let's move on to permanent repairs. Permanent repairs are going to restore the highway to its pre-disaster condition. And here we go back to the pro rata share, 90% for interstate, 80% for non-interstate. And your permanent repairs will require prior FHWA approval and authorization, and normal FHWA procedures are required. If you're using force account labor or in-house labor, a public interest finding is required to perform permanent repairs using in-house labor. 
And once again, as Lisa mentioned, LAP agencies must be LAP certified to perform permanent repairs. These are a couple, this is an example here of damage to a corridor there. And so to restore one lane of traffic would be your emergency repair to enable emergency vehicles, utility companies, and things like that to access the corridor. And then anything beyond the one lane of traffic would then start to get into your permanent repair that would include additional asphalt, striping, and pavement markings, and any slope rehab that might be appropriate. The um, box culvert wash, washing out. So here is an example. If there is a reasonable detour available, and so reasonable, so this is when we want to talk about having these open discussions with the department as well as FHWA about what would or could be considered a reasonable detour. So if the detour is reasonable and the MOT, that could be part of the Repair, if that is not, some type of temporary structure would be considered part of the permanent repair. Eligible items. Your initial first push, first pass, with some exceptions, will apply, and we'll get into that in more detail later. Roadway damage, disposal, and repairs. Your MOT, your traffic control devices, labor and equipment, railroad crossings, a good example of railroad crossings, um, Fed Aid routes only. What we found in our district with SunRail in particular is that many crossings are on non-Fed Aid roads and many crossings are on Fed Aid roads. So it's important to understand those maps and be familiar with those links that Lisa went over earlier in the presentation. Generators used for signals and railroad crossings that have suffered $5,000 in damages and overtime hours for service patrols and police that are performing traffic control activities that are directly related to the eligible ER site. Additional eligible items include the engineering and any right-of-way that might be needed, CEI and inspection services, and here again, the work must be related to the ER site and broken down by hours. This cannot be a percentage, so it must be by hours. Detours for eligible sites, and we've talked about that already some. Overlays, slides, you know, drainage um, embankment slides, toll facilities, bridge and culvert repair, landscaping if it's incidental to other eligible repairs, and there will be others, so always refer to your FHWA ER manual if you need additional information. Ineligible items, pre existing conditions, expenses occurred prior to the event, betterment, we'll talk about betterments later, inmate labor, preventative work, damage to contractor equipment and generators to only restore power to traffic signals. And the list of ineligible items continues. Heavy maintenance, we've got some photos of heavy maintenance coming up. Pavement damage caused by traffic, applicant owned material, erosion damage, prior scheduled work for construction that would be in your STIP. So this might be some bridge work that's already planned and things like that. Catastrophic failure from internal cause, stockpiling materials, and purchase of equipment or tools. In this photo, you can see where we have a group of folks out um, restoring, I don't know if that's a multi-use path or what exactly, but it appears that they may be wearing um, Department of Corrections apparel. So this work would not be eligible for ER funding. And heavy maintenance. This includes but is not limited to minor damage to erod eroded shoulders, filled ditches and culverts, mud and minor debris deposits, 
slip outs and cut or fill slopes. So this is another good time to ask for questions or ask if there's any clarification needed from FHWA. No questions in the chat room. Chris, this is Lena. I just wanted to clarify something um, in slide 29 about inmate labor that um, not only the item per se is not eligible for your funds, but also if by any chances there is a project that, that use inmate labor, um, the entire project will be not eligible. So this is very important for everyone to understand that inmate labor is not eligible and could make your entire project um, not eligible for your funds. Thank you, Lena, that's a good point. Yeah, and, and going with that, sorry, this is Yusuf, uh, in addition to inmate labor, any materials created by inmate labor is also not eligible. So I believe Florida uses some type of uh, pavement marking that was produced using uh, convict labor. If you use that uh, <clears throat> that painting, for example, the entire project will be not eligible. So convict produced material is also not eligible. Activities that do not require prior FHWA authorization, and this would be your emergency repairs. And that would include your preliminary engineering, your construction engineering, and also your emergency or temporary roadway repairs to restore essential traffic. Activities that do require prior FHWA authorization, these are your permanent repairs. And here again, these are going to follow your normal FED aid procedures. And then you will, it will include your preliminary and CEI and your right of way and time extensions. And there are a couple of occasions when a revised DDIR will be required. And this is for a scope change or a cost increase of 20% or more. Deadlines. One of the best practices we've implemented in the district with Lisa's group is when she sends out these emails about events. She will also include these key dates in her email for you. And this is something we've learned from some feedback and also from some previous training. But for your emergency repairs, your cost incurred within the first 180 days from the day of the event is reimbursable at 100%. Cost incurred after the 180 days is reimbursable at the regular pro rata share that we've touched on earlier. Your move to construction obligation. All ER projects must move to initial authorization within two fiscal years from the fiscal year of the event. And then your DDIR submittal, they must be submitted within two years of the day of the event. And we have a chart that's going to help you understand this. In our district, we've got Hurricanes Matthew and Irma as a good example of how to follow these timelines. So for Hurricane Matthew, the event occurred October 6th of 2016, and then Irma, the event occurred September 10th of 2017. And when you start to think about Federal Highway's fiscal year, Matthew occurred early in the fiscal year and Irma occurred late in the same fiscal year. Going back to Hurricane Matthew, for the emergency repairs, your 180 days at 100% reimbursement was April 4th of 2017. For Irma, it was March 9th of 2018. Now we'll look at the two-year date to submit DDIRs. For Hurricane Matthew, that two-year date was October 6th of 2018. And for Hurricane Irma, that was September 10th of 2019. 
But where it gets, where these dates start to converge is the construction obligation deadline. Because remember, both Matthew and Irma, even though they occurred almost 11 months apart, they're still within the same fiscal year for Federal Highway. So for Hurricane Matthew, the construction obligation deadline is September 30th of 2019, and that is the same for Hurricane Irma. I want to add one thing onto that from a District 5 perspective as it pertains to the construction obligation deadline for you as a local agency. The easiest way that we can tie what FHWA has as their obligation to your local agency project is your advertisement date. So for us, we will be looking that your local agency permanent repair project is advertising by that construction obligation deadline. So in the example, in these examples, advertisement would have had to have occurred prior to September 30th of 2019. For questions. Any questions at this time or any further clarification from Federal Highway? Uh, nope. Just one comment uh, concerning the two year deadline to submit DDIRs. Uh, that is a set deadline, and we cannot provide an extension on that one. For the construction obligation deadline, if enough justification is provided on a case by case basis, that lead line could be extended. But please take under consideration that the one for the DDIRs, that one cannot be extended. So if you, don't, if you submit something, for example, to FEMA, and then a year and a half later, they submit it back to you, or two years later, say, this is Federal Highway, you might lose your chance of eligibility. So just FYI, the two-year deadline is not, uh, we cannot extend it. But the construction obligation deadline, it could if enough justification is provided. And to follow up on that, even though Federal Highway has the two-year deadline to submit DDIRs, generally the district, our, our office, will be asking for DDIRs much sooner. And that's to help us budget and plan the work. There's no questions in the chat. Okay. Debris changes due to MAP 21. Lisa explained the difference between FEMA and FHWA ER funding earlier. And what we'll talk about now is the difference, how this impacts you as the agency in debris. So if there's a governor's declaration and a presidential declaration, and the Stafford Act, the presidential declaration, does include debris, then, it, then your debris will be FEMA eligible. If there's a governor's declaration and no presidential declaration, then your debris will be Federal Highway ER eligible. If there's a governor's declaration and a presidential declaration, but the presidential declaration does not include debris, then your debris will be FHWA ER eligible. Or this is um, a case that we encountered in our nine county district with Hurricane Matthew. If there is a presidential declaration, but it does not include all impacted counties, the counties that were not included in the presidential declaration are eligible for FHWA ER debris reimbursement. And the um, example in our nine counties with Hurricane Matthew, Matthew was generally a coastal event. So Brevard, Volusia, and Flagler counties were included in the presidential de declaration. The debris associated with those three counties was FEMA eligible. The debris that was inland with our other six counties, since it was not included in the presidential declaration, was eligible for the FHWA ER program. So it's important to understand 
what those declarations say. They will, and they'll just. And you cannot assume that it's going to, even if there's a presidential declaration, you cannot assume that it will include your county. First push. This is your initial effort to clear the roadway, which includes cut and toss operations to push debris out of the traveled way. Your first pass will be the initial effort to collect debris pushed aside during first push operations. And this will include your vegetative and non-vegetative debris that must be collected at the same time as first pass within the debris clearing limits. Now let's talk about debris clearing limits. This will be your traveled way, your clear zone, or the lesser of what we're seeing in this example. So for your interstate, it's either going to be the lesser of the right of way or 50 feet. For a US and state route, it'll be 40 feet or the right of way. And for other Fed Aid roads, it'll be 20 feet or the right of way. And now's another good time to um, ask if there are any questions or clarification needed from FHWA. No questions yet. We're good. Debris removal reimbursement will include your initial pickup and hauling, and then the ineligible activities will be for excessively long hauls and secondary hauling. Debris removal, documentation. Take, get as much documentation as you can. That's the message here. So you've got load tickets. This will include your first pass, date, quantity, and location. You'll want to have a summary sheet of all your load ticket data, invoices that will include monitoring, reduction, disposal, and keep your FHWA eligible debris and associated costs separate from your FEMA debris until your reduction operations and see the FAQ sheet, the FHWA FAQ sheet for details and equations related to that. Photos, and take, when you think you have enough photos, take more photos. So you want photos of the debris operation before and during debris removal. And if you're using force account labor, you need your labor, equipment, materials, and photos as well. Debris staging areas. Locate potential sites prior to the storm. Have backup sites available and coordinate with agencies for NEPA to avoid environmental delays and any possible endangered species and habitat impacts. And with our nine counties, I can tell you that the evaluation of potential debris management sites, we do this all year long. We are looking for sites and have backup sites available. And one of the things we mentioned earlier was the long haul distance. As we are looking at our debris management sites, we'll map these sites and then calculate haul distances. And we'll actively seek out debris management sites within areas where we're trying to, where we have gaps in our routes. Here is what looks like to be tree or debris that has fallen in a waterway. So would this be eligible? No, this would not be eligible for the FHWA ER program. Heavy maintenance. Here the crews are clearly working outside the clear zone. And they're doing maintenance activities. So here again, this would not be eligible for reimbursement through the FHWA ER program. And this is another good time to ask for questions or take a pause or any clarification from FHWA. Uh, this is Yusuf. Hey, uh, can you can you go back to slide 39 very quick? Sorry, no, uh, 40, I believe it is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when we say ex excessively long haul, just to clarify this, 
please when you when you're hauling just go to the closest one i don't i don't we don't really mind if it's five miles 20 miles 30 miles as long as it's the closest one to you and also to clarify secondary hauling if you have a temporary location and you haul to that temporary location that's going to be eligible moving it from the temporary location to the permanent that's considered secondary uh, hauling so that would not be eligible for reimbursement. That, that was about it. Thank you, Yusuf. Any other questions? I just wanted 4041, 40, I just want to point something out. I know you mentioned it, and I just want to repeat it, um, the, the fact that it's so important, the documentation for debris removal. Uh, we, are, we need the photos. I know you, you said that, and I just wanted to set it again. Photos, photos, photos are very important for us to, to be, because we're not in the field and we cannot see where it was located and the distances. So photos are the only documentation that really is gonna help us to make the determination. And as an example of that for the district, I touched on Hurricane Matthew earlier where our inland county, Sumter County, Lake County, we had some debris that was picked up with our in-house forces and, and we did not have adequate photo documentation. Um, so, you know, these are lessons we learned and that's a hard way to learn them. But yes, photos, so learn from our mistakes. You need plenty of photos. <laughs> and the fact, yes, and the fact that it's before and during the debris removal. So we'd like to see the actual debris, not the clean area. No questions, Chris. Our DDIR is Detailed Damage Inspection Report. In most cases, there's one written per site. And earlier, Lisa talked to us about what a site is and it's a preliminary cost estimate. And you're looking for that site to be $5,000 or greater, and that will include your materials, equipment, and labor. It's a determination of eligibility. It's a brief description of the scope of work, and it's used to support FHWA's Florida Division's request to headquarters for ER funding. A DDIR is not a contracting mechanism. You do not use the DDIR to indicate scope, quantities, or prices to the contractor. You do not give the DDIR to the contractor. It is not a NEPA determination or approval, and it's not authorization to begin permanent restoration work. The DDIR is like a snapshot in time. It's going to tell the story for anybody picking up that DDIR. It's going to have specific location, your beginning and ending limits, your fed aid route number, nature and extent of the damage, the state and county, congressional district, whether or not your um, it's emergency repair or permanent repair, your eligible FHWA roadway will be identified, the date of the event, the disaster number, and the DDIR number. And the date of the event, the disaster number, and the DDIR number will be information that will be provided from the district. Your DDIR will also include cost and quantity estimates, type of contracting method used, a recommendation, and also there will be that concurrence from FHWA. And then from the district perspective, we'll also have plenty of photos with that DDIR submittal to FHWA. The general requirements will include the form, a cost summaries or spreadsheet, and it should not be lump sum, photographs of the damaged site, bridge inspection report, and what we found with Hurricane Matthew, I'll go back to Hurricane Matthew and our causeways in Brevard County. The district was able to provide the inspection reports leading up to the event, pre-event, 
to demonstrate to Federal Highway that the bridges, the causeway bridges, the facilities had been properly maintained and that the damage the district was reporting after the event was a direct result of the event. So those bridge inspection reports were valuable. Copy of the contract if work has already started, and then your Fed Aid classification map showing the site and the eligibility of the ER roadway. Two phases of a DDIR. We have your initial, which will be used to establish estimates and eligibility in major items of work. We talked earlier about a revised DDIR. Remember, your initial DDIR is an estimate. So it's not completely uncommon to have a cost increase of 20% or more or a change in scope. If either of these two things occur, a revised DDIR needs to be submitted to FHWA along with a justification of the changes. And upon receipt of adequate backup, there will be the FHWA DDIR approval and the FEMIS authorization. And we've covered a lot of material here with DDIRs. So is there anything, any questions or any clarification from Lena or Mahmood? Yeah, this, this is Yusuf. Uh, I wanted to emphasize something pretty quick. When, when you guys write up a DDIR, please make sure that it's a standalone document. But basically what that means is that when you write it up, somebody that doesn't have nothing to do with the project, is not even from the state, should be able to pick it up, read it, and concur if it's eligible or not by himself. So if, for example, if you got, if Florida concurs as uh, participating, somebody in DC should be able to do the same thing based on the backup documentation. So it should be a stand alone document. That's a big, big uh, thing that we're pushing. It has to be a standalone document. Uh, another thing is there's a section in the DDIR, I think we're gonna see it later on, that says uh, description of damage. When you provide that information, please do not write damage due to the hurricane. We already know that. Please be specific of, okay, damage, uh, erosion, shoulder, uh, bridge, uh, uh, scour, stuff like that. Be more specific when providing that type of information. But yeah, the, the one thing I wanna emphasize, it has to be a standalone document. Uh, if you write it, give it to somebody in your office that has never seen it, and if he determines the same thing, you're probably good to go. That's, that's something we wanna emphasize. That's about it. And thank you for that clarification. That's a very good point. There's an art, it's a skill to write a DDIR and get all that information together. Um, they need to be thorough and detailed. Correct. NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, all projects require a NEPA review, and this is particularly important if impacts are to protected or sensitive resources. And advanced coordination with appropriate resource management agencies will help avoid delays. And in our district, there are many areas that have sensitive resources. So your NEPA review is critical to the project, both your emergency repair and your permanent repair. And as soon as you find a location that needs repairs, begin to engage in those discussions about NEPA approval or concurrence. Emergency relief projects must comply with all NEPA requirements. So generally, your emergency or temporary repairs will be a categorical exclusion. And historically, your permanent repairs will as well, with a couple of exceptions, that may be your betterments, your bridge work, and any impacts affecting resources. So here again, just a reminder, begin those conversations early if you believe your um, repair may impact a resource. Emergency repairs and permanent repairs do require 
utility certification, right-of-way certification, railroad certification, and environmental certification. For emergency repairs, these certifications can, get, can be completed concurrently. So you can go ahead and start your emergency repairs while you are obtaining these certifications. For permanent repairs, you must or you shall have these certifications prior to initial authorization. Betterments. This will be an improvement to the facility, and it may include a feature not existing prior to the justification. I mean, prior to the disaster, sorry about that. <laughs> Your justification will be to prevent future eligible damage, will include a cost-benefit analysis, and will also mention that you're going to meet current standards. So FHWA prior approval required except for betterment to meet current standards. Current standard must be provided as part of the DDIR backup documentation. So basically, I kind of jumbled up that slide, but basically for a betterment, one of the justifications that's important here is that you want to meet current standard. When you're preparing your DDIR, include that current standard as part of the DDIR package. And to prevent eligible damage, this is a betterment um, justification that we have used in our counties. So there are reasons to do that. This is a photo of an I-75 cantilever sign. It's a huge structure there. Amazing what wing can do. You'll notice the base of the sign is behind the guardrail but the sign panel itself is in the clear zone. And this is one that you'll want to engage your partners, both the district and the district will reach out to FHWA for a structure like this. So the removal of the damaged items that are in the clear zone would be your emergency repair, but then to reconstruct the sign structure itself would be a permanent repair. I believe this picture is also an example of a situation where a betterment was improved. This particular sign kept getting repeatedly blown over, and so it was approved to move the location of the sign as well as to construct it in a slightly different manner is my understanding. And so that was a situation where to prevent future damage, a quote unquote betterment was approved. Um, versus doing it in the exact same place in the exact same way over and over again. In general, damage outside the right-of-way is it in, ineligible for emergency relief funding. If it is eligible, it must meet four criteria. It's di directly related to protection of the highway. It's not eligible for funds from another agency. No other agency has responsibility, and the applicant agrees to accept future maintenance. And this is another good time to um, ask if there are any questions or if there's any clarification from FHWA. Hi, this is Yusuf again. <laughs> uh, can you go back? You're just talking about betterment pretty quick. When you talk about uh, showing a cost saving, uh, take under consideration that it's a cost saving to the ER program. So if that site has been hit, let's say, three times, but never due to an ER eligible event, then we probably will not consider it for betterment because it's, you never expended ER funds on that. You have to show that it has been hit multiple times due to an eligible ER event. Uh, and yeah. That, that was the thing. And the other one was the work outside the right of way. It has to meet all four, not one of them. It has to meet all four of them. Thank you. Good clarification. No questions yet. Okay. Well, thanks, Chris. Now that uh, we've discussed the types of repairs, eligibility, and the DDIR process, we're going to take a quick look at the contracting mechanisms and requirements. 
In short, the same items that apply to every LAP project apply to emergency repair projects and contracts. Every construction contract must include FHWA Form 1273, the Davis-Bacon labor rates, uh, and there are a few exceptions to that, which we'll discuss in a moment. They must encourage the use of disadvantaged business enterprises or DBE firms. They must incorporate current ADA requirements. They must include Buy America provisions for the use of iron and steel. And as Chris mentioned earlier, they cannot utilize convict labor. Contracts must be procured utilizing approved contract mechanisms, which we'll look at uh, over the next few slides. And there's more detail on those contracting mechanisms available in the ER manual. And FHWA, or excuse me, FDOT standard specifications apply. For emergency repairs, there are multiple contracting mechanisms available, which include your standard competitive bidding, a solicited contract. An example of that would be uh, providing a solicitation package to three FDOT pre-qualified contractors who will then provide their bids for the project. And this was actually a process that was used by the district for the emergency repairs on A1A following Hurricane Matthew. Um, contracting mechanisms also include negotiated contracts, uh, force accounts or use of your in-house forces, joint participation agreements, as well as the potential for reduced advertisement time. Additionally, some agencies may choose to execute pre-event contracts for item, items such as traffic signal repair. Pre-event contracts follow the standard lap procurement process. And we highly recommend that if you as a local agency are looking to procure an FHWA eligible pre-event contract, that you coordinate with the district and allow us to review that solicitation package before you put it out on the street and the lap construction checklist should be used as a guideline when preparing that package. The solicitation for permanent repair projects are handled in the exact same manner as a standard lap project using the standard competitive bidding. And again, we've said this a couple times, uh, but uh, it's worth stressing that a local agency must be lap certified to administer permanent repairs. Uh, as I mentioned a, a few slides ago, there are a few situations where the inclusion of the Davis-Bacon wage provisions uh, for emergency relief contracts does not apply. And that would be when local agency staff are performing the work or again, uh, force account work, or when the contract is solely for debris removal. So just for the debris removal efforts themselves. Davis-Bacon wage rates must be included in the contract if debris removal is being combined with any other construction, alteration, or repair work. So if you have uh, a situation where you have a construction contract and part of that construction contract includes the debris removal, then Davis-Bacon does apply in that situation. Um, so we'll stop there, uh, see if there's any questions on contracting mechanisms or if FHWA has anything else they'd like to add. Hi, hey Lisa, this is Lena. Just wanted to add something about the pre-event contracts. Um, so right now for permanent repairs, we have um, the traffic signal repair and roadway lighting pre-event contract. So if by any chance there is a local agency that would like to use those pre-event contracts, um, just to coordinate with the district and contact central office. But just wanted to mention that, that we have those pre-event contracts available for this hurricane season. And also for emergency repairs, there are also um, debris removal, as you mentioned, cotton toss and traffic signal repair. So there is a couple of pre-event contracts available for, for local agencies. So just to clarify with you, Lena, and perhaps with Chris as well, are you indicating that those pre-event contracts 
that the department has can be utilized by local agencies or that local agencies can use those scopes of work to procure their own pre-event contracts. From Federal Highway standpoint, uh, we have approved the scope of work. So we, so we, we approve the scope of work. Yeah. Go ahead. So then a local agency would request that approved scope of work from the district to utilize when they're soliciting their own. Correct. So, for example, the scope of work doesn't have all the federal requirements because it's not an actual contract. When they actually start soliciting the contract, they have to make sure that they include all those federal requirements in the solicitation so they don't risk eligibility. It's but the, the new thing is that now we have pre-event contracts for permanent repairs. In the past, we didn't allow them, but now we do. So now they can go ahead and do traffic signal repairs and roadway lighting uh, with a pre-event contract. Thank you for that clarification. So again, that's why it's very important to coordinate with the district if you are looking to advertise those pre-event contracts, A, so that you can get that FHWA pre-approved scope of work, and B, so that we can do our very, very best to try and make sure that you have all of those federal requirements in your document. Because if you execute that contract and it didn't include all of those requirements and you start work, you now have made that work ineligible. So please coordinate with us if you want to um, advertise those type of contracts. So it's no question. So I'm going to close out today's webinar briefly outlining the communication process that District 5 will be using as it relates to emergency events, particularly during a hurricane season. And we actually um, did this process uh, last year. Um, I Hopefully, you as a local agency, those of you um, who went through this process felt it was beneficial. But we will be, uh, probably sometime next month uh, in May, we'll be sending a preliminary communication to you as a local agency that's going to provide general reference materials related to the ER program. Um, it's going to be most, a lot of the same materials we provided today, the handouts that are available today, but just something that you have tangible that you can go back to to refer to. If we activate our Emergency Operations Center, we're going to resend that same information. And we did this during Dorian. As soon as we activated for Dorian, the information that we had sent out in May, we redistributed. And then following event, if there was enough damage sustained to meet the $700,000 threshold, we'll send that same information again, along with details related to the submittal timeline that Chris discussed earlier. We actually didn't get to this step with Dorian because Dorian did not meet that federal aid threshold of $700,000 of damage. So that was actually a blessing to us that we, we didn't have to do that, but uh, that's why that communication did not go out. Hey, hey Lisa, event, Chris, yes. Chris, I want to you were talking about the $700,000. Uh, just to be clear, it's $700,000 of federal share. So if you have an event that the total cost is 700,000, it's still not eligible. It has to be 700,000 in federal share. So basically it might be the 80-20 or 90-10 of the total cost. Thank you for that clarification. So following event, a local agencies will be asked to email our district local program team uh, using our distribution email address, which hopefully all of you are familiar with. Uh, if there's any potential damage that you as a local agency believe might be eligible for FHWA reimbursement. And as I mentioned earlier, that information should be provided as quickly as possible so it can be included in our department summary report to FHWA. And once the district receives an email related to damage from a local agency, we're going to acknowledge receipt of that email, and then we'll provide information to the local agency for the individual or individuals who are going to coordinate with the agency through the DDIR process. The local programs team 
doesn't necessarily have the technical expertise for that DDIR process, but we're going to make sure that we provide you as a local agency somebody that can assist uh, with that process. And so to that point, um, we're going to provide technical assistance related to the preparation and review of the DDIR. You as a local agency are still responsible for preparing that DDIR, but we're going to assist you through that process. Uh, we'll also collect any uh, pre-event contracts that you have in place, concept plans, uh, et cetera. And then we're going to take the lead in coordinating with FHWA regarding the eligibility and also in coordinating the NEPA requirements. If a DDIR is related to temporary repairs, uh, the local program team is going to review that contract that was used for the emergency repairs. Uh, hopefully that's a contract that we've already seen or looked at because uh, it's a pre-event contract and we're already going to have some comfort that the federal requirements are incorporated, but we still do need to look at that to make sure that um, everything is there. And when you provide that, again, provide a completed uh, lap construction checklist uh, to help facilitate our review. If a DDIR is related to permanent repairs, which are going to be administered under a LAP agreement, the district will assign one of our LAP design project managers or LAP PM. We'll do this at the point that they, we have some level of comfort that FHWA is going to approve that DDIR. So as mentioned earlier, we are going to be working between you and FHWA and we'll have some idea even hopefully before a final approval of the DDIR that everything is moving toward FHWA approval. And at that point, the LAP PM is going to become the primary point of contact for items related to the design plans, specifications, estimate, and the bid document review. And that review process is going to be very similar in nature to what we uh, would do for a standard LAP project. If a DDIR is related to permanent repairs and the local agency will be soliciting for a construction engineering and inspection or CEI consultant, the LAP PM is going to notify the local program team and we will begin coordination with you as the local agency to review that RFP uh, that you'll be putting out to solicit that CEI consultant. And again, that's going to occur at the point that there's some level of comfort that FHWA is going to approve the DDIR. We don't want to start that process too soon, have you putting together a document that's going to meet all the federal requirements without knowing that it actually is going to be federally eligible. Once FHWA has approved the DDIR for temporary repairs, we'll start the process of reimbursing the local agency for the temporary repairs. That will include, um, but it's not limited to determining the mechanism by which the payment will be made. Um, depending on how the work is completed, whether it's already complete, partially complete, it may be done by an invoice, it may be done through executing a uh, emergency relief agreement, but it will include requesting FHWA authorization and coordinating internally with the appropriate department staff for the processing of that payment. And then for permanent repairs, the normal LAP project procedures will commence. So this slide contains resources. Um, that are available to you. Uh, everything other than the FH, or excuse me, the FHWER manual can be accessed using that hyperlink. All of the other are PDF documents. They again have been made available as handouts to this webinar. So if you haven't done so already, we'd encourage you to download those. And with the exception of the ER manual, these are all the same documents that we would be sending out to you. Um, sometime next month as a pre-event email, and then again, uh, should we activate uh, for emergency relief. So at this time, uh, we'll open it up for any final questions that you may have on any of the information that we've presented today. We don't have any questions yet, but we'll open it up for two minutes and give people the opportunity to type them in if they have any.
Well, I would like to thank everybody again for your time today. And if you do have any questions that come up at any time, please feel free to reach out to the local programs team. Our email address is D as in district 5 dash local programs at dot state dot f l dot u s we thank you again and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day thank you bye thank you